Hello, how's it going? Truman here. Today we're doing the impressions of Arcane, the League of Legends series. I'll just go into a little backstory about my League of Legends experience. It's really nothing to be honest. Maybe back when I was around 16, 17, around end of high school, I had a friend who was really into League of Legends. Now he was a bit older than me, so he knew a little bit more about like PC gaming and stuff like that, as I was still like a console guy. Still am too, to be honest. But I've only played League of Legends a few times. He said I had a knack for it, but I don't know. I didn't see it. He was like, oh, you're doing really good. And I'm like, uh, am I? I would then later play League of Legends, like maybe I would say five years after that point and really just didn't fall in love with it. Other than that, I live vicariously through the music videos they've been releasing with KDA or that other one I forget the name of. I know the real people who've been playing League of Legends will be like, oh my God, you're one of those people. Uh, Yeah, I am. Sorry about that. But one of my gripes about League of Legends was it didn't really have a strong story. The characters had backstories and everything else like that, but there was no story mode to really drive through. At least not one that I saw. Again, my experience is very small. But as far as I know, there's no story in game. Someone can easily correct me if I'm wrong. I know there are tidbits about the information and backstories about the characters on their pages and profiles and stuff like that. And solely through interconnecting that information, you could create a loose story. This is the same issue I had with Overwatch. I used to be an avid Overwatch player when it first came out. At least for up to a year to two years, I've been playing Overwatch. Or at least I was playing Overwatch at the time. But I truly do feel story is something you should have when you have so many vibrant, colorful characters. A huge range of diverse characters that need to be fleshed out. So lo and behold, here's Arcane. Apparently it took six years to make this show, so by all means it's an outlier to all the rest of animation. I'd even argue this series is more comparable to a movie. The sheer amount of fine craftsmanship that's in this show alone is outstanding. It's mind numbing for me to even think how much work went into this show. Like this is one of those series that make you want to go and buy a DVD for it just where you can see the behind the scenes making of the show. Anyway, we're going to cover three episodes in this video, three episodes in the next video, and then three episodes in the final video. Maybe I'll make four videos if the final episode has like a lot of content in it. So expect a few videos on Arcane itself. So the story opens up with a very stylistic flashback segment. Effects are in full range here. Now for me, I've watched a lot of media. I've seen these kind of flashbacks a dozen times before. And what I really want to compliment this flashback on is this use of zero dialogue to tell its story. We have our two girls here traversing an area filled with death and destruction. We have our estranged man beating what seems to be the enforcement of the area. The girls witnessing their parents' death and the burly man rescuing the girls from the ghastly scene. The introduction itself gives us enough information about the characters. As of now, I've only watched three episodes, so I do not know if they're going to come back to this point and explain more or add more context to it, like why exactly the man is there, or how the girls got to that point. We cut to the opening made by Imagine Dragons. Now, I'm a massive weave, so I've been listening to Japanese music for like the past 15 years straight, so I'm really out of touch with music of today, especially in America. Some great American I am. So while the music might not resonate with me, the opening visuals surely do. Panning shots of these really cool statues that come to life with the camera angles. The opening itself doesn't overstay its welcome, and it introduces all key players in the story. Overall, I think this is the epitome of Western openings. Something that doesn't overstay its welcome, it introduces elements, characters, or tones of the story in a very quick manner. While I like my 90 second anime songs, this one is really good. Now I try not to mention visuals as much as possible because every studio has their own faults, but by god is this show beautiful. Camera angles, scenes, perspective, everything is so great. The world itself is visually appealing. And simply through witnessing the environment itself, we're able to see aspects of society, of the world, and solely just from this shot alone, we're able to see what kind of technology the world has. Hey Powder! Come take a look! And now we're formally introduced to the two main characters, Vi and Powder, later to be known as Jinx. For whatever reason, I want to tell Vi to comb her goddamn hair. Why are two strands still on your cheek? Every single scene, they're still there. Are they glued to her face? Alongside Vi and Powder are these two guys, one I forget their name of. The only one I remember, Milo, because he's voiced by Yuri Lowenthal, literally my favorite male voice actor. Immediately when I heard him, I'm like, that's Yuri. Just who the hell do you think I am? I'm Simon. I'm not my bro. I'm me! Scorpion, can you hold on a minute? I was in the middle of a phone call and it was business. Tell me, who's the baddest of the bad? 
the maddest of the mad, the killer of kings and destroyer of worlds! We talk about survival of the fittest a lot, but all that really means is the skilled live and the unskilled die. Since you're freely in that second group, maybe pick your fights a bit more carefully. You understand what I'm saying? It's never going to matter how much you want it when you're up against someone who can kill you with a sneeze. So I'm glad he's got a role in this show. God, I hope nothing happens to this character. I would really hate it if something happened to him. Anyway, moving on. This is on you, Vi. Powder, look at me! What did I tell you? I'm ready. That's right. Our trouble teens are performing a heist, and we can see that Powder herself is always the last man on the cart, the one they're worried about screwing up the most, as she's the youngest one in the group and she jinxes the group on a constant basis. So our group is now breaking into this really ritzy apartment, <laughs> stealing whatever they can. For the most part, it looks like knickknacks and weird gadgets, but they're taking anything they can find. Powder stumbles upon these blue orbs and decides to take a few for herself. But unfortunately for our adolescent gang, the resin is coming back, so they all decide to bail. While retreating, Powder drops one of the blue orbs, which causes a huge explosion in the apartment, leading to them getting chased by the enforcers of the town. It is indeed a wonderful chase segment. Go watch it for yourself, I won't cover the whole thing here. I also want to mention that we have moments of 2D animation mixed with the 3D surroundings. But it's just something I want to mention, as sometimes the 2D animation does stick out like a sore thumb. By no means is it bad, but it is just noticeable. I'm curious why they went with a 2D approach instead of a 3D approach for most of the effects. It's just a question that popped up in my head. Nice haul. You could say that. Someone really kicked the nest, huh? Is that so? What makes you think- We don't want any trouble, okay? Hear that, Deckard? They don't want any trouble. Trouble finds you. The gang is heading back home, but they're stopped by some thugs in the street. Now at this point, the story is telling you that information travels fast. It looks around sunset by the time the team is accosted by the thugs. We're given the visceral fight scene between the teens and the thugs. And this scene is just further developing Vi's tenacity when it comes to fighting. Her do or die attitude. Wait! Wanna see how that ends? While the teens were fighting, Powder was chased off by another thug, with the end result of her throwing away everything they gained in their hall. You did what? I'm sorry! I get my face bashed in and she just gets a pass? Yep. At this point, the show is hammering in how much Milo doesn't like Powder, his only impression of her being a total nuisance to the team. She jinxes every job. And there you go, foreshadowing. Woo, who would have saw that coming? The group finally arrives at their destination, which is a slum-like underground. There's gonna be a later scene where I question like how deep this place is. Uh, you'll see it later, but I, I just want to mention it now. Like, they go down an elevator, and I'm assuming it's significantly far down, but it could be further than I think. And while the kids are walking through these slums, we get to see what kind of world it is. It's an area rife of debauchery and violence and crime. Wait a minute. <laughs> this, uh, uh, this <laughs> isn't what we agreed on, so... I think you should take it. No, 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 no. I can't think that. Make your choice. We then move over to a bar scene where I assumed at first these were main characters or important characters at least, but they're only here to introduce Vander. I think I know what you need. Don't threaten the guy who pours the drinks. And set him up as a head figure in these underground slums, one who keeps the order. How about you just give Huck the rest of what you owe him and I'll let you walk out of here in one piece. After Vander shows that he's the big boss in the town, he then goes over to the kids. Everyone all right? That was Did you even stop to think about what could have happened to you? Hey? Eh? To them? He then reprimands them for the damage that they caused in the upper ground. Not out of anger, but concern. He's become a father figure to these children. We stay out of Piltover's business. Why? They've got plenty while we're down here scraping together coins. When did you get so comfortable living in someone else's shadow? Vi is upset at society, that the people from the north side, Hilltover they call it, are living the lavish life while they live in the slums, having to scrounge just to get by. Vander himself is aware of this, as he used to be a man who fought for the same cause, with the same passion. Right now though, Vander is more worried about raising these kids right, and making sure that they have the skills necessary to survive the world they live in. When you say light a fire, they show up with oil. But whatever happens, it's on you. This, it's not gonna solve your problems. It just makes more of them. Hopefully just not in the way that he had to. After Evander advised heart to heart, she lets him know that she doesn't know the group of men who attacked them. 
Vander sets out to get more information. We then move on to one of the more cliche scenes, where Powder is eavesdropping in and she hears Milo talking bad about her, only to hear Violet sort of agree and then run off before she hears the other turning point of the conversation. This scene itself doesn't really ring well with me, uh, I think we've seen it hundreds of times before. I think a person's natural curiosity is tend to listen to bad things even for children, so I'm just a bit surprised she didn't stick around for at least another two seconds just to hear the turning around point of the conversation. But all that aside, there's one part of the scene I really do like, which I think is why I call this the epitome of western media, is this scene. See this look on my face? This will always mean it's time to shut up. But I... This is just a totally western thing, it's not something you really find in anime. Like it's a perfect example of just western writing and directing, especially for like animated works. Well hello. While Vander is talking to one of his close buddies, we're introduced to a character called Echo. I know this one is a League of Legends playable character because I've seen him around a lot. He's also one of the poster characters for the League of Legends music video. Again, I forget the name of it, but this one right here. And Echo is the reason the heist happened in the first place. As a man who came to their shop bought a bunch of trinkets, and Echo followed him because of his wealthy nature. And we're given tidbits of how resourceful Echo is. So I'm excited to see more of this character. We're introduced to two enforcers who have also gotten a word of the robbery. Vander being a prominent figure in this underground, they seek him for information. Some trench of trash attacked one of the buildings in the academy district. But you already knew that. We're looking for the card prints. Got a description? And these two enforcers have this good cop, bad cop thing going on. Listen, you shady son. How about you go for a little walk, Marcus? Cool off of it. Go. I really do like this female lady. I don't think they mentioned her name at this point, and honestly, I don't remember it. But she's really cool. I like her demeanor, her stature, the way she presents herself, and the voice acting is amazing. The council needs someone to make an example of. People need to feel safe. Yeah, topside people. She offers Vander a proposition. Give me someone, as they need a martyr to pay for this. But Vander isn't willing to sell out any of his people, especially his makeshift family that he has created now. All the while, Echo was listening in on this information, so now we just keep in mind that he knows this as well. So we're finally coming to the conclusion of the first episode. Vi and Powder are having a heart-to-heart -heart talk, where Vi is just reassuring Powder that she believes in her. She believes that she's strong, that she is capable, that everyone else, they're just wrong about her. Deepening their relationship in turn. I'm gonna stick together. finally move on to a scene with the thug from earlier before. He's getting beaten up, roughened up. Now part of this scene is why I mentioned like how far down are they really in the slums? Because look at this big ass fish. Can you imagine how deep you would have to be to reach an animal like that? It looks fairly deep. We see that our blonde haired individual, Deckard I believe his name is, is being interrogated by the man who hired him to follow Vi. You were supposed to follow them and not you. Now, I'm not 100% sure why he was hired to follow Vi in general. Maybe he knew that they were going to go steal the stuff from the penthouse. Did he need stuff from the penthouse? Because as far as I know, the group was only tipped off because of Echo. So why exactly was his goal to follow Vi in the first place? That's really my biggest question. But anyway, Deckard lets this guy know that it was the kid's fault the explosion happened. Which makes him realize... Vanda's in trouble. Now through this scene we can assume that this man and Vander have some sort of past, or may be associates by some means. He tells Deckard, you're free to go, but you have to lay low now. And he moves over to this scientist. The scientist holding some weird concoction in his hand. They decide to perform this test on this rodent and this cat. The rodent drinking from the liquid, which turns it into this monstrosity. We don't get to see it on screen, but we can assume it's bulking out or something like that. <laughs> A very gruesome scene, I might say. Leading to the scientist asking who the first test subject is going to be, which makes me assume, oh, they're going to try it on people now, huh? Someone just volunteered. We're going to move to episode 2 and 3 in a second, but I just want to give a quick impression on the first episode. I didn't think it was, like, outstandingly stellar compared to, like, huge overarching themes or anything like that. Everything is pretty safe, to be honest, but delivered exceptionally. You don't need to have a crazy plot to have a good story, to be well written. It's all about execution. 
and that's what the first episode does really well. Kids from the slums, executed very well. The reformed gangster, the dissonance of a caste system, and some mad science at the end. When I finished this first episode, I thought to myself, how would the two plot lines interconnect? Between this mad science bit, which seemed kind of like out of picture for the overall plot. So I'm more curious to see how this will interconnect with the general world itself. Because as of now, it's only having me questioning like, what is the real importance of this? compared to our characters. You have to remember that your characters are more important than your plot. By all means, every single time, if you don't have good characters, if you don't have characters people don't like, they will care less about your plot. Characters are what drive the story. And right now, we have a good, strong cast of characters. And Arcane's visual quality is so outstandingly high, I can't help but marvel at it and respect it, that it elevates all of its other elements. A good majority of the scenes are feeding into the character personalities and their relationships, or aiding in developing the world itself. And one of the reasons the exposition is so good is because the characters are charismatic. People tend to think that charismatic characters have to be outgoing or something like that, but in reality it's a character that's able to convey itself properly and powerfully. Whether that be a character anxious about something, such as Powder, or the better example of Vonder being the good old dad of the streets. Overall, I think a very good first episode. A little danger is worth the risk, don't you think? <laughs> ah, careful, that's your parents' money you're dropping. The second episode opens up with a flashback showing what happened right before the explosion. This also explains why this man, when he went to the slums, the lanes as they called it, had so much money, he was given the money by someone else. And it seems to be a girl he's closely affiliated with. The episode then jumps into flashback with his character Jace as a child, experiencing a harsh winter storm. His parent falling to the ground, fingers already purple from the cold temperature. When they're just about to give up, a man appears in front of them, casting a spell, isekaiing them to a different location. I know it's not technically another world, he probably just teleported them to another area of their world, but I like the idea that Jace is an isekai hero, so I'm gonna, that's my headcanon from now on. But with the magic, he has saved Jace's life. And this is immortalized inside of Jace, he wants to recreate magic. Jace is unfortunately imprisoned due to the fact that he was using illegal materials to conduct his research, which would make sense since he got some of it from the lanes. We're then introduced to Professor Heimer Gingai? I honestly don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. I'll let Jace do it. Professor Heimer Gingai. But I do like this character. I do like the overly scientific or the wordy or witty small characters. Imprisonment. What a curious principle. We can find the physical body, yet the mind is still free. I do love a good conundrum. They have a small place in my heart. I believe I've discovered something truly incredible. A way to harness magic through science. The arcane is dangerous, Jace. Jace here has a dream of achieving magic with science. If you will, the arcane with technology. But the professor believes magic is dangerous, and that such a bound should not be leaped. Own your mistakes before the council. Admit your work was dangerous. I theorize you'll get away with, um, how do you say, a slap on the wrist. We go back to our cast of teens where I think this scene only exists to show us that Jinx is a good shot. Once more just reiterating that Vi has conflicted feelings about involving Powder. Now of course part of me questions like why did they not give her a projectile weapon? This couldn't have just came out of nowhere that she was this good of a shot. As this seems to be an area that they hang out in quite often. All the while the enforcers are still looking for information about the people who broke into the penthouse. Which leads to another chase scene in the lanes. Oh, yet I remain the poorest Madonna. Excellent choice, Counselor Madonna. We move back to Piltover, where we're introduced to, oh my god, the sexiest character I've ever seen. Jesus Christ, she is so attractive. Like, can I simp for a second? Like, oh my god, this character design? Oh my god, everything about her? Like, seriously, I would just take a show with Madarda alone. Next season of Arcane, just call it Madarda. If I may. We need something revolutionary, Laura. Something to put Piltover on the map. So this councilwoman herself seems to be a bit of an ambitious person. She wants to see new depths reached, new reaches of innovation. I'm really for it. I'm for her, obviously. I myself too am a person who wants to see new heights reached every single time, even I think to a detrimental degree. Now a good portion of this episode is building the interactions of the characters such as this girl to Jace. Her parents have a certain disdain for him, especially after the explosion, and wish for her not to see him again. We've got the numbers to beat them. Yeah, let's teach them what it means to mess with us. Yeah. We crossed that bridge once before. 
We all know how that ended. You're just protecting your kids. I'm protecting our people. We can also see distrust is building in the lanes, as Vander is not once the man they knew, the hero that they sought out. Instead, he's become soft. Do I look afraid? No. You look weak. In reality, he's more of a family man. While I do believe he would protect anyone in the lanes, I truly do think he thinks of those kids' safety over everything else, since he wants the best for them. They are the future, after all. Vander's gotta deal with the Enforcers. What deal? Echo also spills the beans to Vi about Vander having a deal with the Enforcers. Like, there's a lot of scenes, and we're gonna jump a lot in this second episode. The first episode was very comfortably, slowly paced. This one is by far much faster. We then move to the council. This is a huge range of characters. I don't know how many of them are genuinely going to be important to the whole story. They do all have very nice character designs though. As long as Medarda is there, I don't care. Now this whole trial scene is amazing. I love the directing behind it. And I have a weak spot for spotlight. So when the scene turns dark and the spotlight shines down, the sound of it, the look of it, everything about spotlight directing, I'm a fan of. So it's a little bit of a bias on my side. So you're saying your study was meaningless? It was revolutionary. Revolutionary how? All I see is a boy meddling with things he doesn't understand. So while the trial is going down, the counselors are spouting their opinions and Jace is getting a bit frustrated because of it, or they're not understanding his endeavor. So he finally spits it out. I was trying to create magic. Arcane talents are something you're born with. They can't be... Fabricated. And this is the easy way to give exposition for your power system. The arcane is the curse of our world. My race was nearly destroyed by it. Side note, what exactly this guy's race is? Are they just robots? Is he a robot because his race was literally screwed over? Someone decided to say, hey, F you guys in general, and turned them into robots? What happened here? <laughs> If they're robots, how do you not just make more robots? I don't know. Despite Jace's efforts to convince them all that his endeavor is for good, it's for the better cause, Heimendor says, You don't understand what's at stake. I've seen this power in the wrong hands. It corrupts. Consumes. Now, in all honesty, I don't know if they really needed that many counselors. It seems like more of a character design showcase, sort of to like how you have anime where you have a bunch of characters in an organization and their character designs are really what tells them apart. They're a good sense of exposition, and I understand why a council would exist in this world, so I'm not like taken aback that there are this many of them. It's just personally, I think maybe there's one, maybe two, maybe three too many. That itself is a personal bias, so take it as you will. Luckily, Jace's mother comes to his defense, with his punishment being banished from the academy. So once again, we're given many quick scenes. Evil Eye Dude finds Marcus, the enforcer paired with the husky-voiced enforcer from earlier that made the deal with Vander. The deal being that he knows a way to get those four children. I'm about to make your day. We also see Jason, his mother, his mother telling him to let go of the dream, and Jace is just not willing to do so. Beautiful, aren't they? Again, this is why I say they have to be really, really deep down in the water. Look at that. Can you even see rays of sunlight or reflections of light coming down here? Like, that looks like almost a sea floor, and normally those are pretty deep, especially to have like rocks like that and creatures that big. Don't get me wrong, I'm questioning it at all, but it's such a cool set piece. They're monsters. There's a monster inside all of us. That's such a good line, I like it a lot. So now a monster is born. I'm sorry. I just wanted to explain. I think you've done enough. We're given more scenes of Jace's life just falling to pieces. And ironically, it's not even his fault. If anyone would be to blame, it would be Echo. And that's something that's mirrored throughout the whole show. The incidents that occur never tend to be the person's original fault but the actions of others. And sometimes those actions are altruistic, but they end up hurting so many people. I'm curious to see if Jace were to meet Echo, or if he were to figure out the information of the people who ruined his life, how would he feel towards them? The culprits must be apprehended. So the enforcers are now getting pressed hard to find the culprits behind the penthouse incident. Turn the Undercity upside down if you have to. Just find them. This forces the kids into hiding as the enforcers check out the bar. 
With this, tensions are rising. The enforcers search the bar to find the children. With the children's only option is to go into hiding, but Vi is done with that. She wants to fight back. Vander knowing that he's heard these words before, possibly seeing a mirror of himself in her, doesn't want her going down this road. I want Powder to have more than that, and I'm willing to fight for it. But who are you willing to lose? Milo? Clagger? Powder? Vander decides to once again have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Vi. She's a youth conflicted with the lifestyle that she's been given, wanting more for her life and the people around her, while they have to sit there and look at the people who are living it up. Nobody wins in war, Vi. But Vander knows this all too well. He's doing his best to get her to realize that violence solves nothing. Now part of me wants to know what exactly went down between these two sides of society. As far as we know now, one oppresses the other. But how we got to this point is very important. We move back to Jason, his never-ending suffering. He's finally about to end it all. Oh my god! Oh my god! Am I interrupting? The hell's your problem? What's that? We learn that this individual is also from the underside as well. He's had his run through the mud just to get to where he is. I don't even know your name. It's Victor. And we finally learn his name, Victor. But now Victor and Jace are allies, looking to create what Jace calls Hextech. An alternative to magic. You know, Powder, what makes you different makes you strong. Always remember that, okay? We get another scene of Vi and Powder. Vi once again reassuring Powder that she is special, that she is different, and that she can be strong. And the episode ends with a cliffhanger, with the enforcers walking towards somewhere. It could be the bar, or it could be where Vi is standing. So now for the impressions of episode 2, I enjoyed episode 2 a little bit less than I did episode 1, only because the fast pacing really just threw me off. I understand the jumping from scene to scene, but I thought some scenes just were way too short. By the time we can intake the information, we're on to the next thing. The end segment with Vi reassuring Powder once again, I felt like wasn't as necessary as I got the point from the first episode as Vi herself is just saying as many platitudes as possible to Powder. Still, that scene is supposed to fuel the ending where we have the cliffhanger where we don't know if Vi herself is going to take on the Enforcers and this could be her, her final moment. We know it's not, I think any audience member would know it's not. And then there's a lot of other things to mention in the episode, such as the Council. I like a lot of them, at least design-wise. And to be honest, Medarda will be the one that sticks in my head for the future to come. This is one of the liberties of having it be CG, or at least some semblance of 3D, is that you can go with character designs this complex and not worry about drawing them over and over in frame. Overall, the second episode is here to help build the world, especially with the introduction of magic and how it works. Now, personally, I would have liked to have seen the magic user use magic before him saying I want to create magical technology. That way I can at least have a good comparison instead of like a flashback. Also I want to know if the person who helped Jason in the beginning is it kind of like a Jojo Bizarre Adventure Part 4 thing where it doesn't actually matter who he is. Is he just the ideals that represent Jason's life? Is it something Jason would just live by? Or is this a real character? I'm sure those who play League of Legends will know and notice all of the fan service. I truly don't. I know of Vi, Jinx, Echo, Ari, if that's how you pronounce her name, the Ninetale Fox Lady, and a few others, but that's really it. So I'm sure there's a ton of fan service, especially with the council. Of, unless the council are all playable characters too, someone could tell me, leave it in the comment if they are, if they aren't. You don't have to give me spoilers. And so far, just from looking in it as a person who doesn't play League of Legends, I think it's pretty good that it doesn't seem like it's obvious fan service for the sake of fan service in front of my face. I would say Arcane is newbie friendly. Would it give me to play the game again? No. But it would give me to play any other League of Legends spinoff game, that's for sure. That has a story, I should say. Because I suck at online games, I suck at competition in general. So that's episode 2. Episode 3 kicks off with a monologue from the dark-eyed individual. He makes remarks on his viewpoints on life and references an old friend at the very end of it. By far, this is the most anime thing in Arcane so far. Like a character sinking down under the water talking to themselves feels very anime. 
we immediately then jumped to where the last episode ended with a cliffhanger of who was going to find Vi first. And when they're in first, it's on their way to Vander's place. Well, we find out Vander is the one who finds her. We don't have much time. Protect the family. What are you... No! Vander, knowing what's coming next, decides to protect Vi, hoping that she will take his stead in his place and protect their family. I do like Vander's resolve to turn himself in, as it's the only way to save his family. Again, it's on the more cliche side of things, where we have a guardian character lock away their protege or their student or a family member in a room while they turn themselves in. We've seen it before. Despite this, I do enjoy the relationship of Vander and this enforcer. I keep forgetting her name. I think it was like Grayson or something like that. I'm not putting you away, Vander. The council needs its pound of flesh. Without you down here, it all falls apart. Even with her acknowledging that you should just turn in the kids. Without you here, this place will fall to nothing. <laughs> We're barely a few minutes in and shit hits the fan. Something I really haven't mentioned because the cursing lines really aren't that important to the story, so I, I probably won't show as many clips of it. Maybe they say shit one too many times. Everyone says shit. Like, it's so crazy. Everyone is cursing on a consistent basis. So, I don't know. For me personally, maybe I would think just tone it a little bit down. I would think there might be a little bit of Puritans around who don't curse as much. And then as far as blood goes, I think the first episode was a good foray into like the level of violence we can expect. If things are just going to escalate, they'll get worse from there. So by an episode 3 hits, I'm not 100% surprised at the amount of blood and violence that it has, as it rarely comes off as like gratuitous or just for the shock value. We're finally given the dark eyed man's name. His name is Silco, a previous acquaintance to Vander. And Silco here has unleashed his monster. Wait! This wasn't the deal! Deal's changed. It's very unfortunate that Monster has killed one of my most liked characters so far. She's just dead. He also kills the fat junk tinkerer as well. I respect that the show just outright kills them instead of injures them and leaves them to have a few final words. And characters that I was warming up to as well. But these actions build up Silco as an antagonist. Anyone in his way is as good as dead. And what's very important for antagonists is to make sure that their actions mean a lot. And taking lives is the greatest way to show that. And better yet, these are characters, like I said earlier, that I was warming up to. We at least got to meet them. We're about 80 minutes into the series. By regular episode standards, if it wasn't 40 minutes long, we would have been 4 episodes in. So it's not like these are just brand new characters out of nowhere. Now episode 3 is fairly easy to break down. There's really two plots. There's the Silco Vander plot and the Jason Victor plot. I'll just sum up the Jason Victor plot really, really fast. They achieve what they believe to be Hex Tech. This is only achieved because they have Madarda helping them out, choosing to fight for their cause. So I'm going to assume this Hex Tech stuff is going to play later on to the series because when you create new technology, especially one like magic that has a possibility of hurting other people, their technology will go into the wrong hands. I'm just going to make that assumption. Of course, I haven't seen the future episodes yet at this point. So their milestone is one for the world building. We cut back over to Vander and Silco. And we get to learn more about Silco's motivation. He wants to inject fear into Piltover, the people of above. In order to make them understand that the people in the lanes are people who are not meant to be messed with. Vander, of course, disagrees. We can finally realize a dream. Look at what you've done. You'd sacrifice everything that we are. It's not the way. Knowing now that violence only breeds more violence. We're finally given insight to who gave Silco his injury. It was Vander. So the conflict between Silco and Vander is one that we've seen before. Two men who used to fight for a cause. One still hanging in there, believing that fighting is still worth it. But as time goes on, he becomes more drastic with each step. And one who found out that fighting was meaningless. Trying to keep what we already have was more important than taking what we don't have. Vi comes back to the Hada and lets the group know that Vander has been taken and that she's going to follow. They took Vander. Who took Vander? I don't know, but I need to help him. We're going with you. I need you to sit this one out, Powder. What? You're not coming. While the boys are allowed to go with her, she tells Powder to stay behind, telling her she's not ready for this. 
And from here, Powder feels betrayed. Remember, we spent two episodes building her up, building up this relationship that they had. She believes that Vi still had confidence in her, that she could be something else, that she could be special, that they could rely on her. Vi knows better. Vi knows it's a dangerous situation and that Powder could die from this confrontation. She's only doing what she thinks is best. And that's a common theme in Arcane. Characters doing what they think is best and those actions resulting in other people getting hurt, whether or not it be indirect. The actions made will affect someone else. If Silco lets his monsters loose, it could wreak havoc upon the upper world, only for them to take action against the people down below. <laughs> From here, Powder has an insane and immense breakdown. Like, she is going through the works right now. And I can only applaud the animators from this segment as it is amazing. You can feel the intensity of her emotions from this scene. So just once again, props. Just props on the delivery on this scene. But Powder then realizes that she still has the blue orbs, the Hextech spears. And with this, she decides she can help her family after all. Then we move on to a hilarious scene to me, where a trio of teens sneak into Silco's base, and the first thought I had to myself, I was just watching quietly at first, but I'm like, there wasn't a single guard at all? How did you get in? There's guards everywhere. It was easy. We found an open window and- It was at this moment that he <sighs> knew he fucked up. I mean, at this point, you can then tell that Silco is a master at planning, or at least guessing what's going to happen next. And since they're caught in a trap, Vi decides to stall as long as possible. And we get to see a really good fight scene and see Vi's prowess in a do or die situation. I guess the one with the thugs was pretty dangerous, but it doesn't seem like they were going to kill her. Well, at one point they were, but that's after he got his ass kicked. Part of me is really curious, like if this lady is important. We've seen her before, she was the one who disagreed with Vander in the bar a few episodes ago. I think episode 2. Or is she a League of Legends character? I don't know, like she seems important, but not too important. So Vi is here kicking ass and taking names, and so Silco decides to sick the Incredible Hulk on her. Now I'll be honest, I was a bit disappointed in the design. I thought he was going to like bulk out instead of get really big and veiny. He's really lanky, but I thought a more drastic transformation was going to happen. I mean, come on, who didn't see that coming? Now to be honest here, I love myself some gutsy protagonists, like really go-getters, but I also like seeing them get the shit kicked out of them. I feel like it's always a lesson when you have to teach someone, you're not always going to be on the top of the world. A hard lesson to learn, but it's something you gotta learn sooner or later. And I feel like Vi hasn't had that moment yet, at least up till this point. Now at this point, Powell is realizing if I don't help, Vi might die. So she launches her magic monkey clapper with a deadly magic orb bomb in it. Now I must say, this whole segment is amazing. Unintentionally, Powder creates one of the most devastating moments so far in the series. Despite her doing what she thought was the best thing to help other people, she ends up hurting many people because of this. And unfortunately, Milo is freaking dead. Holy shit, Yuri is dead. I'm dropping the show. That's it. Fuck! But in all seriousness, she inadvertently ends up killing a majority of her family. All because she thought she was doing the right thing. I guess a net boon to that is that she destroys a good amount of Silco's products. That way he can't create his mass monster army. He also blows off that lady's arm. It totally gets disintegrated. All the while, Powder falls into the water, looking gleefully at her creation. This leads to Vander's final stand. At this point, I thought he was going to die just right here. There's no way with all the injuries he just sustained that he could win this fight. The emotions are racing. Vi is there crying as she's stuck under the ground, witnessing the death and destruction around her. Vander is fighting for his life just to save the family he has left. All the while in the midst of this chaos, Silco comes and stabs Vander. <laughs> I knew you still had it in you. Dealing the final blow to his old friend, his brother. So color me surprised when we see Vander turn into a monster. I mean, I'm not 100% surprised since he fell into a ton of vials of it. But I was kind of hoping that after Silco stabbed him, that would be his death. He would die there. As Monster Vander is just a plot device just to make sure that Powder sees him die. And sees the aftermath of what she's caused. Did you see me? My 
monkey bomb finally worked. How did then comes to seeing gleeful that her creation worked. Ecstatic going to tell Vi, it worked, it worked, I saved you guys, I helped. Only to see that her actions have killed the only people she knew as family. I love the moment she comes in so happy, ecstatic and the immediate realization of what happened. The culmination of all of this brings Vi to her boiling point. I told you to stay away! Because you're a jinx! Do you hear me? Milo was right! The girls now estranged from each other are taken by two different men. Vi by the enforcer whose greed took over. The same greed that allows Silco's plan to come to fruition. Empowered by Silco himself, taking in the girl. We will so episode 3 I like a lot. I think it's a good origin story for a villain or a villainess. Someone who doesn't have particularly good morals. Because as far as I know Jinx herself is an outlaw. And it brings me back to saying that even if you're trying to do the right thing, sometimes it creates negative results. Was Powder in the wrong? I would say yes because Vi told her to stay there. She should have trusted her sister's intuition. I don't think at any moment could we have said Vi should have trusted her sister. But she really doesn't have a good track record. I really do love the dynamic between the two sisters. Being torn apart through the most drastic of situations. I'm excited to see where the story goes from here, that's for sure. I believe overall the story itself isn't revolutionary by any means. But it's definitely overcompetently portrayed. With great directing, stellar animation, Superb sound design. The pacing is hit or miss. Episode 2 really had pacing issues, but episode 1 and 3 I think were perfectly paced. In my qualms about episode 1 of where was this mad scientist route going and how it ties back into society itself puts many of my worries to rest, as I feel like they won't introduce anything that's not important. Of course, I would only expect as much if they took 6 years to make this show. Other than that, I'll be sure to watch the next 3 episodes as soon as possible and get a video out to you probably around next week or so. I want to thank everyone for watching. If you've watched Arcane yourself, what do you think of it? Uh, try not to post spoilers. If you do, please put a big, big, big spoiler tag. That way I don't read it by accident or someone else who hasn't gotten into the show doesn't read it either. Sorry, this video has probably been very long. Uh, thank you for sitting there and bearing with me for a, a long amount of time. Now, I'll definitely see you guys for the next one. Peace out.